What a community that we have. So last year's summer reading program raised $3,000 for local charities, including the Food Pantry and Mission of Deeds and the North Suburban Family Resource Net, uh, Network. We have study buddies where middle schoolers can sign up to get triggered by high schoolers. We served as the early voting location for two elections, uh, both in late August and then again in late October. And none of those were all strictly the idea of a librarian or the library director or even the library trustees. Those are all collaborative thoughts and ideas and needs and solutions that we came up with community groups, town departments, and just residents in our community. So I think that's one sort of silver lining to all of this is being able to see how people can really work together and come together and help each other, even in a time that was fairly divided and isolating. My name is Sherry Vandenacker, and I'm here today to speak with Amy Fang Lannan, the director of the Reading Public Library, about some of the things the library's been doing through this strange pandemic period that we've been in. So, Amy, thanks so much for coming on today. No problem. I'd love to be here. There's so much to talk about. It's been a really interesting journey. It certainly has. <laughs> so, um, the the pandemic period has been a strange period, as we know, and we've gone through so many phases as we've learned more about disease spread and as transmission rates have changed. So how about telling us some about how the library has adapted um, its programs and its services to the people of Reading, because you've been open the whole time, but in non-traditional forms. Absolutely. We, we, the most we were closed were, were, uh, was probably for March, April, and May of 2020. Um, at that point, they were just virtual programs, um, both synchronous and asynchronous recorded and live that were available. We had no other types of um, services available. And I think like every other uh, town department or business, we went through about 15 plans and ran them by command and you know looking for what was the safest way to provide service not only to the public but within our building and, and, and within our staff so we tried different staffing schedules and everything but things really kicked off in the summer and um in uh june 10th of 2020 we had our first big event was a, a big return uh, at the high school field house and um i think for me that really stands out because first of all, we, we set up in the, in the high school parking lot and got 8,000 items returned to us. And while that is a huge number to, to receive and check in, I, I think what that sort of represented for, for us at the library was the whole community working together. We had the fire department and facilities and DPW, and we had the police department, and we had, um, you know, the town manager was there. and you know, almost every project that we'll talk about today involves not just the library, but other groups in town that sort of worked to help us all help each other. 8,000 items. Now, were those all out before the pandemic started or were some of those items that you uh, brought, to let people check out even after the pandemic started? Yeah, you know, interestingly, there was a, a pretty big run between March 1st and March 14th when we closed and there were a lot of checkouts. Uh, once we sort of announced that we would be closing for an unspecified period of time, people were quite literally walking out of the door with, you know, huge bags of materials to get checked out. Um, so it, it's a little bit up, um, but at any given time, we have a normal percentage of our materials are always off the shelf. Um, of course, we also added a lot of digital materials. We, um, I think, tripled the uh, amount of investment that we put towards uh, online downloadable ebooks, audiobooks, streaming movies, streaming videos, that kind of thing. So, actually, Amy, you say that you were closed, but you mean the building was closed. The library was continuing to provide services through this whole time, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. So, 
the programs, like I said, some of them were live. Um, the first thing, which is sort of an interesting little tidbit, normally you don't see things like story times. Now they're ubiquitous, but um, in the old days, pre-COVID, uh, many of those books that, that you read aloud at story times are copyrighted and they're not allowed to be recorded. So one of the first things that publishers and authors did was come out, work to come out and say, please record our stories live for our little people and young people and readers to really enjoy. So having that free reign, you know, we just started off with story time with Chumley and sleepy story time and um, things like that. So that was a real um, thoughtful thing for uh, writers and publishers to do is to give us the permission to, to share out the, the literacy with, with folks. Did you have any way to track the statistics of how many people attended those? Did you end up with more? Yeah, we did. We And we, we kept track. It is a little different when you obviously, when you have live, you have attendees. So um, some programs you would have, um, you know, I think in one month we had you know, we'd have several hundred. It was definitely down from our normal programming. Um, it's a little trickier when you get to recorded um, and archived materials because those hits keep going and going and going. So we do try to, to, to track those. Um, all of the reporting that we do to the state obviously has been, has been modified, but uh, in general, the virtual programming is continues to go up. I mean, we regularly get, 30, 40, I think uh, at Waking Up White, which we had on March 31st, we had 80 people attend. Um, we've had birding programs with 80 people online. Um, we've actually considered opening up our Zoom uh, to over 100 people. So it's we wouldn't normally have those turnouts in live person because maybe somebody who's older didn't wanna go outside uh, in, in the evening, or maybe it wasn't convenient for them to drive. So um, it's actually, we really uncovered a whole new way of providing different types of services to people who can't necessarily make it to the library. I think a lot of us are thinking about how the pandemic has created or pushed or forced or accelerated changes, some of which will stay with us even after the pandemic is pretty much over. So do you foresee offering more virtual programming in the future than you might have before the pandemic started, even once technically people can come back? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, there are some speakers, authors, lecturers, um, either in an interactive sort of Zoom format or a Zoom webinar where it's sort of more lecture um, type that we would not have been able to host because we would have to fly them out or there'd be travel costs and overnight costs and things like that. And when you reduce the spending on that and you're really just paying for someone's um, time, it, it, it opens up a whole, you know, you can a whole new venue of a whole new area of where we can have people speaking from and, and, and you know, I've seen a lot of programs, we've done some in conjunction with other libraries. Um, getting some really big name speakers using those big licenses to get 100, 200 people uh, to participate and hear, um, you know, best-selling authors who are normally quite difficult to to get a hold of and prohibitively expensive. So, I think I think we'll continue to see that as a, as a format of reaching out and um, bringing information and and understanding to people. So paradoxically, in some ways, by being pushed into this virtual platforming, the library has been able to expand its mission to serve all of us here in town, perhaps even beyond. Yeah, and Sherry, you bring up a really good point. It's one of the first things that, um, you know, not, not just Reading Library, but all the public libraries, and particularly the Mass Board of Library Commissioners, uh, who works with all the um, public and academic libraries in the state, one of the things that this pandemic has done is to really uncover and um, the cracks in some of our systems where people are falling through the gaps. One of the first things we noticed was that um, some people don't, didn't have the technology to get online or they weren't, they didn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, we did do a marketing study um, and found out, you know, there are, it's not a ton or a large percentage, but there are people in our community that do not have broadband access that do not have um, portable uh, Wi-Fi technology. So we now offer hotspots, Wi-Fi hotspots, and we now offer Chromebooks for people to use um, and borrow. So I think, yes, it's difficult, particularly for people who are used to getting certain types of services and it's very comfortable and it's very known and it's very, you know, it, it just feels natural. 
I think what we discovered were, were smaller pockets of people who in our community who we had not been able to reach before and were even more desperate and weren't able to provide those services now, which was a real learning, um, a learning experience. So let me make sure I understand. So if somebody's struggling with internet access, they can go to the library and borrow a hotspot in a Chromebook? Yes, they can, and they can take it out. Um, it's part of our, uh, sort of part of our library of things, which had traditionally been a little more um, equipment-based, like a sewing machine or a telescope, uh, something like that, that was sort of more of equipment, one-time use. Uh, but we are now um, adding a lot more uh, communications technology, um, we have, uh, actually we have, um, or we will be adding uh, like a jitterbug, a portable flip phone for people if they need to take it on a travel uh, with the limitations. I think everything has to be used within the US. Um, but uh, I think you just start to realize, first of all, how lucky we are to have what we have and also where the gaps are of, of people who are in, a little bit in need. Oh, that's fascinating to me. So tell me about the community conversations you've been able to host. Mm. Yeah, so one of the things we, we had hoped to do some conversations, we started the community conversations called the Pulse of Writing, what's at the heart of our community, back in 2018. And the idea was to bring our community in together, to call everybody together and talk about with each other face to face what uh, is working in our community and what's not and what, what, can, what we can do to, to, to work together. And an in-person use a format called the World Cafe. And what's wonderful about this is that um, people get to speak to, to one another and they can't sit at the same table with someone for the whole time. So you have to get up, you have to meet people, you have to interact. Um, the physicalness of uh, conversation in a facilitated manner, it does all these wonderful things to your brain. It turns on empathy, it builds connection. And um, obviously COVID stopped that. Um, so from 2018, we were able to generate a series of conversations for 2019, and those conversations centered on civility, change and transition, and uh, belonging. And those three conversations led to what we had hoped to do in 2020, but were unable to do until January of 2021, uh, which was, uh, and so those three conversations in 2019 generated the themes for the next uh, iteration of conversations. So in January and February and March of this year, we hosted some really uh, difficult conversations, some undiscussables, and we were able to do it virtually. It actually transitioned quite nicely. We, we had one conversation called, let's talk about race. Why is it hard to talk about race? It is something that's difficult. We also tackled what is privilege and why does it matter? And the third uh, topic was what is power and how do we use it? Because we each have different types of power. So there are very small learning elements in some of those discussions, but mostly it's about bringing the community together to talk with each other. And you can do it virtually, it's not ideal, but um, uh, the feedback, you know, we, I think we had at our first Let's Talk About Race, we had about 80 people uh, signed up for that, which was phenomenal. And, um, about 40 and 50 for the subsequent ones. And so it's it's just nice for people to start the conversation. And uh, one of the things it tends to do, like I said, is to call people in rather than call people out on some undiscussable topics. Great, well, I'm excited that people are in Reading have embraced the challenge of connecting virtually and using Zoom to go into these discussions. Maybe being able to be at home makes it a little easier in one way. Yeah, I, and one of the things, and, and I'd be curious, you know, when all of this goes by and there's some ambitious PhD student out there doing qualitative and quantitative studies, um, there is a leveling effect, I think, with Zoom. Um, it's, or with online virtual platforms, there, there is a bit of safety, there is a bit of autonomy um, that you don't necessarily feel in a physical space. Uh, so there, there are advantages to that. Um, you know, you have a lot more, you have a lot more agency in terms of being able to just bounce off the call instead of 
running madly out of the room. So you can do that a little more gracefully in those situations. But um, we have found an incredible amount of honesty, authenticity, and vulnerability in the conversations that we've been having, which um, is really wonderful at building trust within our community. So Amy, you had to keep the building closed for a while, but then you were able to open it again. So how have circulation patterns changed? Hmm. They even gone up? Yeah, actually, um, we are currently at about 85% of our normal run rate for um, this time of year. Um, we do have busier summers and slower Februarys, and you know there, there are trends in, in, in circulation of physical materials. Um, so right now we're running at about 85%. It is, as far as I know, the highest um, run rate of any of the noble libraries. Um, we've always traditionally been within the top circulating per capita, and now we're just the top circulating library. So we're very proud of that. Um, we do notice an uptick when we're able to have browsers come in. More, more people are willing to come in and grab a few items than just call or go online and reserve a book and pick it up for that curbside service. So we are anxious to have people coming back in and, and browsing and using our collection. But having said that, we've also seen incredible jumps in our use of um, downloadable audiobooks and ebooks and our streaming with Canopy and Hoopla, where there are, you know, I think Canopy is a lot more uh, documentary and um, sort of educational things to watch. And uh, Hoopla has TV shows and movies and, and some really wonderful things. We've really been able to embrace the streaming technology, which has been wonderful. Um, for those who can't afford to, to subscribe to their own personal streaming services. Uh, it's interesting because when you think about circulation, I think people tend to think about going into the library and finding that book and taking it home. And of course, that's always going to be one of the joys of a library. Uh -huh. But you're saying we really need to think about circulation and services in a much broader context. And it has a much broader definition than it used to. Yes, absolutely. So for example, if you take a New York Times bestseller, how many print copies do you have? Do you need an audiobook, a physical audiobook, a downloadable audiobook, a digital ebook? How do you balance that out? What's the wait list? Um, you know, there actually is a, a little bit of an art to how we how we select materials in addition to our collection development policy. Um, so we need to to really balance those out uh, and, and make sure that we're we're meeting the Again, you know, with the audiobooks and, and, and regular print books or ebooks, not everybody learns the same way. So we need to try and provide as many alternative ways to access the information as we can. It sounds like you guys are meeting the challenge as always. We're with trying. <laughs> so uh, what is the status now if people want to go into the library to study or to look for books? Sure. What? So we are really anxiously awaiting this month. We're hoping this month may um, to get into uh, just walk in browsing with no um, uh, limits on the capacity for browsing. Because we have very limited computers and very limited study space, we anticipate using a, a reservation system for that. We do respect people's privacy. You can register with just your first name or you know, Mickey Mouse if you wish, but uh, we have limited resources. So we wanna make sure that we're equitably uh, giving access to those limited resources to folks. But browsing, um, it's a big building, it's a beautiful building, it has a wonderful ventilation system. Masks are required, as long as there are masks required by the state indoors, then there will be masks required in the library. So um, we hope to have all of our soft seating back somewhere maybe in June if things go well, um, which means you can actually come in and sit down and uh, you know maybe read a magazine or read a newspaper. Right now, there's not really any comfortable place to sit. So we kind of come in get your stuff and leave. We miss, we miss all of our friends. We miss our families. We miss our kids and teens and all of our older friends. Um, they really are um, part of our family. And um, I have seen some amazing compassion coming through on both ends in terms of uh, patrons or residents checking in on staff. Oh, I haven't seen so-and-so for a while. Are they okay? Is their family okay? To our own staff um, noticing, ah, oh, we haven't heard from so-and-so for a while. They normally take out books every week and um, just checking in on people and making sure we have a lot of homebound patrons that we've been trying to continue service for. 
Um, they're some of our most vulnerable patrons, so we have to be very careful about how we handle those materials. So we're trying to get to make sure that they get our, our connected. Um, it's, we work a lot with the Pleasant Street Center folks to make sure that we're connecting there. So it's again, it's a joint operation with all of our community groups. It's not just the library. So if I wanted to go to the library tomorrow to mm -hmm get a book or I, do you have any study spaces available now? Yeah, we do have, a, we do have study spaces on all three floors available. And um, depending on the time of day, it's, it's busier. Um, with the kids back in school, we, we, do, we do notice a slight shift, um, but we have a lot of uh, older students who are studying from home right now. They're finishing up their finals and they're writing their papers. So we have quite a busy, uh, busy schedule with folks uh, studying and, and reserving those desks, but we have spaces on all three floors. And then we have PCs available um, on the ground floor and the, and the main floor. So what would I do? Would I call the library to make a reservation or can I do that on your website? You can I... apps. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I didn't interrupt, but you can absolutely do it on our website. You can absolutely call and you can, you can walk in. Um, I, I don't think I've seen it full. Um, and if it is full, there's sometimes we can kind of shuffle things around and, and squeeze in one more person. Um, we do need to make sure, obviously, that we keep our distance and everything is clean. Um, but really walking in or just giving a ring and saying, hey, is there a space available at two o'clock today? Um, and right now our hours are a little stilted. They're not quite our full hours. Uh, the reservations and walk-ins are generally between 10 and 12 in the morning and then either um, one o'clock to eight o'clock or one o'clock to four o'clock. The cleaning that we do at, at the lunch hour and then uh, slightly before closing is, is just sort of extra precautions that as the state relaxes their requirements, we will as well. So um, we're hoping to go back to our nine to nine, Monday through Wednesday, one to nine on Thursday, and nine to five on Fridays and Saturdays in June sometime. Great. Amy, what didn't I ask you that I should have asked you? Um, getting back to that, you know, our, our, our summer theme last year, um, you know, we pulled off a summer reading, remote summer reading program last year. And the theme was reading together or reading together. I guess it depends on how you, how you look at it. And I was just struck as I was thinking about talking to you and talking about what the library has done sort of what a community that we have. So last year's summer reading program raised $3,000 for local charities, including the Food Pantry and Mission of Deeds and the North Suburban Family Resource Net, uh, Network. We have study buddies where middle schoolers can sign up to get tutored by high schoolers. We served as the early voting location for two elections, uh, both in late August and then again in late October. And none of those were all strictly the idea of a librarian or the library director or even the library trustees. Those are all collaborative thoughts and ideas and needs and solutions that we came up with community groups, town departments, and just residents in our community. So I think that's one sort of silver lining to all of this is being able to see how people can really work together and come together and help each other, even in a time that was fairly divided and isolating. Thank you. All right, so what we need to know in Reading is the library's made wonderful adaptations to help us get through this time. There are all kinds of uh, streaming and download and e-access that has expanded through this period. But those of us who love going to the library absolutely still can. We can give you a call, make a reservation or pop in to see if there's space. And not only do you have those services now, but you're anticipating them expanding as the transmission rates of the disease continue to go down, we hope. Yes, and back exactly. Yeah. exactly. And we also hope to be doing more outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually we'll get, we'll, we'll get there, but um, hopefully with our weather improving, we'll be able to do more of our story paloozas outside or having some meetups. Um, but you know, people have been qu been quite creative and been happy to do their cookbook club from home, and um, so there's hopefully we'll be able to get back and do some of those things in person. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking today. Me too. Thank you. My pleasure. Um,